Uh, in 2009, I, I received the lucky opportunity to visit and meet Gene and Steve Case. For some of you who are not familiar with them, and they're the ones that created that thing called America Online. This was the first access point to try and get everybody into the global world wide web. They're the You've Got Mail folks. That's who they are. So they were sitting down, and in 08, they said to me, we think there's this population of people who are doing things, but maybe a little differently. And by the way, we didn't, in 2008, we didn't even use the word millennial. It actually doesn't show up until 2011. And so we're sitting there, and they say, you know what would be really great is if you could go out and figure out why millennials do things with social causes. Are you up for it? Okay, so what do you, I mean, do you tell them? No, absolutely, this is not us, you know. So we started this project in 2008 to try and understand behavior. And uh, since then, we've had about, I think right now, we're at 85,000 millennials going through our study since we've started. We do everything from we test and we do tracking panels, ethnographic research, you name it. We, we probably have done it. And there's been something that always sort of got to me in this discovery of millennials in general. And that is, does, is today's social involvement with causes and social issues different today than it is in how a boomer today would get involved, right? Because it's interesting, when we do our work, we'll, we'll sit down and go to organizations and say, I want you to tell me how millennials are getting involved. You're like, but wait a minute, we've got 20,000 boomers that are doing it too. And we would always say, because that was part of the project, well, this is the Millennial Impact Project. We're, we're really focused on millennial cause engagement. And so two years ago, my research staff and I said, why don't we look at movements today, or what we would call a social movement, and I'll define that later on, and let's try and understand why anybody today would do something for good. What really happens? And I'll tell you, when you take on that task, it's not an easy one uh, in general. And although I was very interested in it, there was probably one other thing that happened, and it was this photo. So my mom and dad end up moving uh, last year into a new house. And of course, when your parents move, they like to get rid of all of your stuff. And uh, your room becomes the office and everything else going forward. So my mom says, look what I came across. This was a photo from when I was with you and we signed up for Hands Across America. I don't know if you've ever heard of Hands Across America, probably for some of the older in the room you would remember. This is where the We Are the World song came out uh, as well. Hands Across America was one of the biggest social movements of that year. It was 1986. And in 1986, we joined a human chain all across the United States from one end to the other to raise money for hunger. And that year, there was $36 million that came in. If you calculate where that would be, it would actually supersede the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge, which happened last year. And what was very interesting about this photo is, and especially the work I do, right? So I'm like, oh my gosh, this is it. I have figured out why I am doing what I do, right? I have found my purpose. And this, this is all this. So I'm like, mom, I sit down up there and I say, tell me why you drove two hours to Springfield, Illinois to join hands with other people. My response that I hopefully I was going to get was, you know, I have truly believed in hunger. This has been something. You know, this is the activist in her. And she comes out and says, I just did it because it seemed like the right thing to do. And I'm thinking, no, that's not the answer I wanted, right? Because this is, this is my work and research and, and so forth. And she said that that famous phrase, which I've come to discover, happens a lot. Which is that people participate in doing good work because it seems like the right thing to do in that moment. And I asked her, I'm like, so you're not, you have no interest in hunger. And she's like, no, not at all. So I'm like, do you want to volunteer for it or give? She's like, no. And I was waiting for like the family story about how we didn't have food or something that was going to come up. And she's like, no, absolutely not. It's just that all of our friends were doing it as well. Well, that was very interesting because I brought that back to our team and I said, so this is my mom and I signing up for a social movement that was very popular that year. And my mom had no interest in doing it, but on paper, she was a donor and she's actually in this picture showing that she would support it. So what do you think the organization thinks? We've got a great supporter with us, right? So I go back and I say to my team, do we truly believe today that everybody that poured ice on themselves was a true believer in the ALS mission. Hmm. So that sort of started the research initiative to try and go out and, and figure primary things with 
how do social movements get people today to do things that you would never, ever imagine doing it before? When we started the, the research initiative, we wanted to do two things. We wanted to find out if the people who created social movements today and the people that participated actually had the same common vision. Here's a hint. They never matched up. They never did. So we spent time with every leader, and then we took a random sample of people to see, why did you really do this? So we have answers that you would ever, never believe, and then we have the greatest answers from social issues. So it came to this piece that we had to, in the beginning, define what a social movement was. Because how do you define something as a social movement? In today's environment, what's really, really tricky about social movement work is it can be confused often with marketing awareness and campaigns. Right? So, how many of you remember the Bring Back Our Girls hashtag that happened last year? Yeah. Does anybody know what that was for? It's only a year or so ago, by the way. So, there was a terrorist group called Boko Haram who had kidnapped 170 girls in an orphanage in Africa. Um, in that moment, after it had happened, uh, a hashtag goes viral called Bring Back Our Girls. Does anybody know where the girls are today? They're actually still in captivity, but we had forgotten it, right? So we're trying to understand from our standpoint, we looked at all of the biggest hashtags over the last 40 years and see what really happened with them. And then we looked at other campaigns that did fairly well, and then looked at marketing. And what we realized is that in today's environment, it's so easy to create marketing campaigns, but have nothing to happen with it. The major reason why Bring Back Our Girls actually failed it wasn't because it didn't generate awareness, it's because it had no system on the ground to actually bring the girls back. <laughs> it was just a social conversation that we all had. The other thing is, is that as we interviewed people for it, we would say to them, why did you participate? And you would think their answer was, I really want to get them back, right? Well, I felt for them, is what they would say. I'm like, so what did you do next? Nothing. Somebody else is going to handle them. That would kind of move into this phase of, well, why did you actually do things for good? And in the beginning, we realized that a lot of us participate in things for not the common reasons that we think that they will. So in our definition, what we realized is that social movements for good, which tend to be different than social movements or social discussions, actually, actually focus on the interest of a population for some policy change or something for a collective group that's going to matter to them. We probably have a revolution and a movement today to use more technology in mobile environments and our mobile phones than ever before. That doesn't necessarily mean it's a social movement for good in which a population is hurting, per se, or they're trying to get something that they haven't received before. It sort of comes down to the collective power of a group who is underrepresented at times, and it, it also is the collective power of a group who sees opportunity for good in some different way. When we started to apply all of these things, we started out with 625 movements over the last five years. We got it down to 50 that actually met this definition. What that tells us is there's a lot of social issue, do-good messaging that's actually out there, but it doesn't amount to as much as we really, really think it is. In terms of things that go viral, this is something you should know, is, is that the virality of conversations, especially around social issues, the peak conversation is a total of eight hours in social networks. I don't know if you knew this, there were 415 protests and marches on the National Mall last year. But only about two or three of them actually made it into our discussions globally as well. So what that means is that we have so much conversation around doing good but it doesn't necessarily get us anywhere at certain points. So those are great marketing or certain organizing pieces, but they may not be there in general. So it kind of gets to this first piece. How many of you have ever given money after a natural disaster? Think about it, right? You see images, you see certain things, and at first we tell ourselves, boy, that is, that is wrong, or that is something we need to affect. One of the core pieces of our research that we also noticed in our millennial impact studies is we have, as a general society, thoughtful behavior and thoughtless behavior. If you've ever donated in line at the, super, at the supermarket, somebody says, well, you give a dollar to, you name it. How many of you have ever asked for tax receipts and to see what the total impact of that dollar is going to be? No 
what he does it. So why do you do it, right? Well, you do it because that cashier, by the way, who's untrained in philanthropy, whose job <laughs> is just honestly to get you to donate because of some competition, is really set forth to try and help you pull into that empathy. I always like the thoughtless behavior because uh, one of the biggest times that we'll see that we did a study at, at one point for one of the Salvation Armies, one of the largest ones in the country. They were trying to help, they wanted to understand what is the kind of person that donates to the kettle campaign when they're walking into the store. So what do you think? What's the kind of person that would donate? When, think about it, Thanksgiving and Christmas. What's the kind of person you think that would donate to that campaign? Anybody have a guess? Describe that person you think. Somebody with change in their pockets. Change in their pockets, yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Um, little kids. I work at a store and a lot of times it's always little kids going, Mom, Mom, can we get something? The leverage, yeah. I was going to say maybe someone that's not paying attention and is like distracted by all the other things going on and just says yes. Yeah. This is, if you ever, if you're maybe bored and into a research project today, um, here's something you should do is just wait 10 minutes and watch people enter into a store in which the Salvation Army is ringing. You'll notice that there's one major thing in philanthropy that happens, and it's called modeling of behavior, <clears throat> where when you see somebody doing a good act, you tend to participate in the act as well. Unknowingly, like you did not plan that out. You did not think, in about 10 minutes, somebody's going to do something good, and I'm, not, I'm just going to avoid it at all costs. No, you start doing it. So it's interesting. We started to videotape a whole, a whole day at the supermarket to watch people as they walked in. And you get the infamous, get for the change, and then everybody else started reaching. And then you get the one person who's like, I already donated, and then, of course, everybody else passes as well. So we start to model behavior. And what we notice with empathy is, is that as people become empathetic for other people, that modeling of behavior actually occurs too. When you see somebody in hurt and you watch somebody else give, you'll be likely to give uh, too as well. And we started to see that with some of the social movements that we analyzed. We looked at it and said, well, why on earth did my mom do this? Well, she was empathetic towards the image that came out by the Hands Across America organizers. And then she had her friends that said, we're going to Springfield to do it. But yet, in the end, she really didn't care about hunger. It felt like the right thing to do at that time. Empathy actually plays a huge role in why a lot of people participate in cause work or cause engagement. And we forget that empathy is a space that we enter into at times. Now, I will say too, and Elizabeth knows this as well, is that empathy isn't a place where you always want to stay. You need to move them beyond. Because it's one thing to be sad for somebody in need, it's another thing to help and project that uh, forward progressively. So we started to notice that people participate in social movements first because they're empathetic or thoughtless behavior as well. The other thing that we noticed too is that people then move from that to become belongers, believers, and then owners of the movement. How many of you ever participated in what you would call your own social movement uh, as well? Did anybody participate in ALS, Ice Bucket Challenge here? So if you think about the reasons why you participate, right? Um, besides the empathetic part, we also realize that a lot of these movements, it's better to be a part of than not to be a part of, right? If you ever go to a fundraiser, some of you will work for nonprofit causes and you'll have to organize a fundraising auction. And uh, one of the best things about fundraising auctions is they pull in empathy, they share a story. And I remember that my wife and I, have, who are very methodical in our giving, by the way, we started out and uh, uh, my, a friend of ours said, will you come to this fundraising auction, um, fundraising event? I said, sure. And we did it because it was a friend, and we would help support that friend. And I remember in the car, I looked at my wife, Biz, and I said to her, now we're going to go in there, and I'm going to tell you exactly what's going to happen. And I went through, there's going to be a story that's going to make people sad. And I went through all of this, and I said, now remember our very thoughtful giving decisions that we created at the beginning. I'm like the charity's worst nightmare at this point. And she says, yes. And we like shook hands, you know, high five, and we're like, we're going to be strong in there. So then we go in there, and all of a sudden, yep, yeah, what happens is they share a story, and a very meaningful story, by the way. Um, had I been very interested in the issue, I could see myself pouring money on, right, doing those things. But then what happens is I look over and my wife is starting to cry along with everybody else. 
And I look at her, I'm like, what happened to the conversation in the car? <laughs> we were supposed to be strong, right? And she said, ah, yeah, but it's really sad. And then, of course, what happens is my friend stands up and says, I'm going to put a $100 donation down. Who's in with me? I'm like, oh, boy. I'm like, let's just get the checkbook out because we have completely gone and lost it, right? Well, it was better to belong in that moment. What if I said, I'm going to be the only one at the table who doesn't believe in this? It would have been a more awkward scenario. Too. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that's my choice in philanthropy. It's what happens. We tend to belong to things. So this was one of the biggest belonging pieces that we've seen in the last two years, for sure. So we, we actually discovered where this thing happened. Does anybody know how this happened or where it started? Does anybody know the real story behind it? This actually had two false starts before it actually worked. Uh, the, first false, the first start was a group of firemen who were in the Northwest who had done this, not actually for ALS, it was just for their local fire department because their budget got cut and they were trying to raise money and this was the stunt they were doing. Then what happened secondly is that also in the Northwest, in the Seattle area, there was a coach of an athletic team who took this to the next level and started to make this an option um, to get involved. He chose ALS as its recipient, but not until after a month in. It had real no, it was just about awareness in the beginning. What's also interesting about this is ALS realized, boy, we're, we got this, right? I don't know if you know this, but it didn't start by ALS, and what they tried to do later on is claim it as theirs. And there are some really bad things that happen when you say that this population of people were doing this and that's our thing. The group that started it, they tried to sue ALS for trying to take it from them as well. This was a movement started by people, not actually ALS. And then the third thing that happened with this movement is it tricked the algorithm in social media. I don't know if you know how Facebook works, but essentially Facebook works like this. Uh, the people that you know, the more responses you do outside of liking, like uploading a video and calling something out, will make them show up more in your newsfeed. That's how things work. And so this thing had the, the greatest possible piece imaginable. So we interviewed the founders, and what do you think the founders said about their vision for this thing? Do you think they envisioned it to be as big as it was? Nah. Now, nah. actually, they had no idea where the money was going to go yet. They were still kind of working through that. Um, and then the, we interviewed ALS, and of course ALS um, realized later on that they had to gra gravitate towards it because it called them out um, by being a recipient. Did you know that ALS did it again this year? Yeah, it didn't. <laughs> it did. Yeah, this was their second go at it, and it didn't quite work as well. So, a little learning lesson. You might only have a year to work on a little short time to make that happen. We interviewed a full population of people that participated. Why do you think people did it? Why do you think people did this thing? I mentioned earlier belonging, but why else? You think to they look, to look good and show off? Yeah, there's a lot of showmanship that, that actually happened in this. And we went back to, and all of them have not actually become ALS donors ever since. And so we asked them, did they, you know, is ALS the top? And we also looked at all of their financial transactions. None of them had given outside to ALS ever since, and nor have they um, uh, done any more than that year. So what we had here was a movement that was created virally that actually was just a bunch of belongers. Now, some would argue, was the 120 million raise not worth it? No, absolutely. I mean, it, it definitely did. But I think we have to manage expectations. They obviously tried to maintain the movement going forward, and it really wasn't there, because they didn't have it from the beginning. The second one is that we realize that some movements have believers or that they believe in something. When we started to look across all of the movements, it was very clear that there was a population of people that were beyond belonging just doing it because of pop culture. They were actually doing it because they believed in it. Have any of you ever given to a political campaign? You don't have to list one. <laughs> Um, one of the things that we're studying this year is how millennials' political participation influences what they do in the cause world, social cause world. We're trying to see if is politics this year going to shape whether or not a millennial gives or volunteers and so on. And so what we have had to do from the beginning is actually give to every single campaign from the beginning, from last year. It's quite entertaining. There are some fun things and some things you didn't expect. And one of the things that most of the political campaigns will do after you donate to them is start out with one very convincing 
line in the beginning. It'll give you a video. And it will say, I'm so excited that you and I believe in the same thing. I, we believe that, and then follow it with whatever it is. We believe that immigration is an issue, or whatever that might be. We started to notice that belief statements actually had transcended age. You know, when we were looking at why did a boomer participate in a, in a millennial movement, maybe, and it was because they shared a common belief together. Belief systems and statements are actually the most strong, strongest marketing statements any nonprofit cause could ever make. Because nobody in the population can tell you, well, I don't believe that you, or even though we share the same belief, no matter how the organizations run or anything else, that's the one common denominator that they have. So those that actually believed in the issue would usually start out with a statement by saying, yeah, I, I believe, like you, that this is an issue we need to address together. When we found that there were true believers, this is an organization called Liberty in North Korea, which I'll talk about later, which is a movement we highlight a lot of, is that they always start out very strongly in any fundraising message, any volunteer message that says, I'm so excited again to have you a part of our movement because we share a common belief that Liberty in North Korea needs to be free of refugees, blah, 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 whatever the filling in. And so when we looked at it, belief statements and believers tended to be very strong. When we spent some time with Scott Harrison at Charity Water to try and figure out why the Charity Water thing escalated to where it was or where it is today, is everybody familiar with Charity Water? Very popular social movement as well. Um, Charity Water just surpassed one million donors, by the way, fairly well. And he actually told us he thought that was a failure. He thought it would be at 10 million. I was like, I think a million supporters is pretty good. You should be happy with it. You should also know that Charity Water's intention was never to focus completely on water. It was supposed to be charity colon shelter, charity colon, you fill in the blank with the, it was supposed to be the model they wanted, but he never got people away from Charity Water, so he hasn't been able to replicate that in that instance. But he talks about the early days of Charity Water, which by the way, almost all of the leaders of the social movements that we interviewed, none of them had started with dollars, all started with people power. And he would go to his friends and he would start out by saying, I know that you would probably buy a refrigerator from me if we sold one, because you're that good of a friend and family member. I don't need you right now. What I really need is somebody who believes that water is the issue. And if you truly believe it, then I've got a role for you to organize and get other people. If you just want to support me because you're such a great friend and family member, I'll call upon you later on when I need you. So in the beginning, he recruited believers only and pushed the other people to the side. And that's exactly how Pencils of Promise became successful. And it's very similar to some early other movements, including Liberty North Korea and, and others that have been successful in the last two to three years. They didn't focus on going viral first. They focused on getting a population of people that believed the issue was imperative in that moment. And then lastly is owning. We realized that almost all of them had made investments in getting people to own the movement enough that they could craft their own message. Uh, and when we say by owning, meaning that they, they weren't supplied the three bullet points on what to say, they were actually given a logo to mess with, to change, to do whatever it was that would acquire their people in it. All they cared about is the concept in general was kind of there. And in fact, in the ownership space, we started to see peer fundraising be popular, peer volunteerism, grassroots activism, all of these things in social movements. And guess what? Boomers were just along the way with millennials as well in, in doing those things. So we see this sort of system that goes from that almost all of the movements had a population of people that just did it because it felt right at the time. We had a population of people that truly believed in the issue, and then we really had a population of self-organizers who were in that issue constantly that were driving the movement base. All of those made the successful things that you hear about. Now here's the thing that you should know. In the terms of Bring Back Our Girls or Human Rights Campaigns, One.org, all of the more infamous ones over the last two to three years, you should know it didn't happen overnight. Almost all of them worked for a good two years to develop a population of believers and a system on the ground, including when we were spent time with Black Lives Matters initiatives, where they built the network first, and then the social discussion and media had also hit at the same time. But they had a base of grassroots supporters who believed in them, so when necessary, they tipped it over to make the conversation happen. Any time that we saw a movement didn't have that base of grassroots support, it went out of our conversations fairly quickly within about a week or two. And then it fizzled to raise money as well. 
Well, when we sat down with the Bring Back Our Girls initiative, she was very, she was in a more failure state, she said, because she felt like she didn't, had she known what she needed to know now, she would have set up a better base on the ground. And there was no policy change actually occurring that was, that was there. All right, so the other thing too is the message part. Um, how many of you have heard any really good social movement messaging in the last two years? Anything that comes to mind? Anything that you remember? Nothing? TED Talks. Yeah, yeah. TED does a really nice job uh, of creating a movement of learners uh, as well. So in the messaging, the belief statements were really high. There were two strategies that we saw happen, and there were two scenarios that you should realize. <clears throat> The phrase opportunity to and here's your chance. Anytime those two messaging components were positioned with a belief statement, they actually got far more traction with getting people to do things. So it would be like this, we believe that this needs to happen, now's your chance, are you with us? And you'd be like, oh my gosh, how could I not be, right? So it would propel the person into doing it. One of the best scenarios, and I don't have it in here, is um, if you're familiar with uh, the Girl Effect, has anybody heard of that organization? They do women's empowerment overseas, initially started by the Nike Foundation, but they have since sort of removed their name from it, although they're the, the, the major supporter of it. They would start out with a statement that says, this is the girl, this is the year to make girls impossible to ignore. Are you it? And you can imagine the amount of participation that drives people into the organization that way. I will say they're also fairly creative on the messaging. Their homepage at one time was, do you think the world needs a good kick in the pants, yes or no? And there was a two buttons that was like yes or no. And you could click on no, and it would bring you to a page that would say, we may not be for you. How about that, right? Uh, I don't think many boards would pass that. But we still have it if you're curious to see what it actually, because it took a good screenshot of it. Um, but in the, in the messaging part, the participatory language with the positioning of an opportunity to do change combined with a belief statement would consistently get people to do things. Now here is how the nonprofit sector actually communicates. I know we like stick figures, so I thought I would keep this in there. Typically today, because there are so many nonprofits in the world and there's so many social causes in the United States, you will often see positioning that says, we are, this is who we are, this, this is how we're different, here are the three things that we do, and usually there's three famous words with it. We empower, we educate, or we innovate. Usually one of those three in some way. <laughs> and then we help the community. So when you go to the population, by the way, who's not as socially cause engaged as we are, because you are all socially cause engaged, they tend to hear that and they're like, how is that different, how is Boys and Girls Club then different than Big Brothers Big Sisters? because they all educate, they innovate, and they do things in the community, right? So you're asking the general population out there to start to differentiate between organizations, and it's very, very difficult when they hear messaging. Now if you were positioned by say, we believe that a person growing up has to have this type of mentor, if you do too, then we're, we should be working together. That's a different scenario than saying, this is who we are, and we're gonna splice and dice it based upon an approach model that you may not be familiar with. Uh, as well. So when organizations talk today, they typically use a lot of things like we statements and mm -hmm. us. I will tell you that anytime a we statement or an us statement is used in our research, we'll look at this, usually the organization raises less money and has less participation. Why do you think we and us wouldn't do as well as you or your opportunity? Anyone want to take a guess? Empowerment. Exactly. Yeah. Because what we have to realize is that philanthropy has two parts to it, right? Philanthropy has benefits to the beneficiary, and philanthropy has benefits to the donor as well, right? So it's, this is your chance to do something for someone else, versus saying, help us get to $500,000. Well, why should I help you when I really care about the individual, they want to circumvent the, the institution? So every organization wants every person to talk about them as if they're the best thing in the world. But in reality, when we saw the movements and the early leaders that were very successful in getting a lot of people to do things, it was always all about a belief statement and opportunity and saying, this is your chance to make a difference. Here's your opportunity. Are you willing to take it right now? 
they were very good storytellers in shifting the narrative away from we need you to give to us, we need you to volunteer for us, to this is about you and your effect you can have on other people. <clears throat> very different proposition than what we're seeing in the nonprofit field. So essentially, we are asking people to move into this model where the entity becomes, so like in the girl effect, they didn't lead in that message by saying, the girl effect is about making women's empowerment, girl empowerment this. They started with a belief statement, which is that we believe that this is the year not to ignore girls. Do you believe that too? That's an issue statement. It's a belief statement in which that somebody can attach to much easier. 